Good morning. My name is Tiago Macieira. I'm going to be talking today about Qt Network Access and uh, how you can do flexible and powerful access to data on the Internet. First, a little a bit about myself. I'm a senior software engineer here at uh, Qt Software, Nokia, transitioning to product management. And I've been with the company two years almost already, close to three years since I first started. And um, I have degrees in engineering and I have an MBA. My work here at Trolltech, well, sorry, at Qt Software now, is mostly with networking, as you can see from this presentation, which is the area I'm working on. Uh, also, input and output, so Qt process, interprocess communication. Yeah, you can say it's a bit about sockets as well. Threading and the tool classes. This is the area that interests me. Other duties that I have are I'm a liaison to the KDE community. In fact, I come from the KDE community where I started about eight years ago. And um, it's from that KDE community that I found out about Trolltech and started working for this company and now I'm with Nokia. I'm also the release manager for Qt, meaning that I'm the one uh, responsible for creating the packages that are published both to the open source community and to customers. And I sit in all of the meetings that have to do with the road mapping and uh, discuss with the quality teams and the other developers when the, the releases are ready. <clears throat> so enough about me. Today I'm going to be talking a bit about networking. So first of all, why things are necessary. Then I'm going to introduce you to how the designs of Qt Network Access are and a bit about its API. And then I'm going to be showing lots and lots of examples. I hope that that's enough for everybody. We'll see. And then I'll give you a sneak peek of what's coming in Qt 4.5. We have had some improvements and um, I hope you like them. So. Let's start with the background. The internet is full of data. Everybody knows that. Some of that data is good. Some of it is bad. But that's not exactly what we're discussing here. The point is that people need to access that data. And it's not just the internet. Just, it's not just the World Wide Web. I mean, there are web servers. There are um, mail servers. There are other kinds of information that you might need. So companies have intranets and extranets and other buzzwords that come to mind. And the applications often need to access that data. What are the reasons why? What could an application need for data? I come up with a couple of ideas here. It could, for instance, download updates and optional features from the internet. Depending on how your application is done, it can just download the code and start using it. It could upload the results of some operations that it did. It could even upload, for instance, bug reports, crash reports, and that would help you improve your application because your application is automating that feedback. It could also obtain data that it needs. For instance, it could download uh, a music from a music web store, or it could download reports on the latest um, progress on your sales team. And it could also download the weather forecast, because apparently everybody needs to know the weather. Otherwise, you cannot even enter a lift. You don't have anything to talk about. So downloading the weather forecast is very important, apparently. Before we had network access in Qt, we had QHTP and QFTP, which are the two most important protocols for data access. So these two classes provided HTTP and FTP communication. Does everybody know what HTTP and FTP mean? So these classes had the ability of sending any command that you needed. They gave you access to all the information that the reply came from both standard and non-standard replies. So you had everything there for you. 
And in Qt 3, we haven't had this class called QURL operator, which in Qt 4 is simply moved into Q3 support. It's Q3 URL operator, which was basically a way to put together QHTP and QFTP. If you think about it, Network Access is actually the su successor to QURL operator. But that class was also very limited. We, want, we think we can do better. Like I said, QHTTP and QFTP could be better. The operations that they provide are very low level. The developer who is using them must know what HTTP and FTP are and how they work, meaning they have to understand the commands to be sent to the server in order to retrieve the data. HTTP is actually doable. You just send one command and you retrieve the data. But on FTP, you have to remember to log in, set your password, change to the correct directory, and then download the data. It sounds a bit complicated. It is. That means it actually means it's easy to make mistakes. Yeah. Those classes are also based on state machines internally. And they're very easy to break. They're fragile. Do you know why I can say these classes are fragile? Because I didn't write them. Yeah, no. Um, they were good at their time, but we thought we could improve them. And another thing was that they almost had no parsing of the replies, meaning you get the raw data. And if you're interested in something inside there, for example, cookies in HTTP, I'll come back to that later, you have to parse it on your own. That means re-implementing code everywhere, duplicating code, and who says duplicating code probably means bugs everywhere because it's not centered, it's not centralized, meaning all the fixes go into one place. Here's one example of how you do it with QHTTP. This sample code is basically doing two operations on the Trolltech.com web server. It's downloading the home page on the third line and downloading the dev days page on the fourth line. Sounds so far simple. Except that you have to remember to read everything at the request finished signal because when the first one is done, the second one is going to start and it's going to override everything. So if you forget that, you will only get the second result. And you've missed the first one. That means you just discarded everything you downloaded. You have to record these IDs that you get from the commands so that you can match the ready read and the request finished to what you sent. So you have to implement quite a bit of logic behind QHTTP to download that data. What's more, we thought that QHTTP could support more of HTTP itself. The protocol is full of features, like I said, for example, cookies, but also parsing of dates. And QHTTP supports a small subset only. For example, the only one I can think about right now is the content length, which is basically a number saying how many bytes it is. So improving that support was on the plans, but we also knew that it was fragile, meaning we probably would have to do a full refactoring of the internals. And that probably meant that user applications would be full of regressions because we would, were doing that refactoring. So to be sure that we were not introducing those regressions, we, had, we would have to do quite a lot of work. And then WebKit came along. This presentation is not about WebKit. But WebKit was a driving force behind network access. Why? Because WebKit requires an abstraction layer. It originally comes from KDE's KHTML framework, 
which uses KIO, which is the KDE's input and output framework, which is very advanced. Qt Network Access isn't, doesn't support nearly as many features as KIO, but supports the important ones there. So WebKit, the early code that supported, um, on, was supported on Qt, worked with QHTTP, so it provided its own abstraction layer because it also needed to load files. That's important in every browser, unfortunately or fortunately, how you prefer. So it meant that there was no support for FTP. And the file access that I've just mentioned required separate code. So WebKit had to implement that abstraction layer. We thought we could do better. So we thought that that abstraction layer that we had started in WebKit, we would make it public. So the requirements were very easy to use, but possible to extend. It had to support HTTP version 1.1, FTP, local files, and this tiny protocol called data, which doesn't have any access to files, but simply returns the values that you gave it. And all of those differences between FTP, HTTP, local files, even Qt resources, they had to be abstracted away so that you just had one interface for it. And also more features that WebKit required. Cookies, like I've mentioned already, but also proxy handling, caching of the authentication, because you go to a website and it requires a password, you type it once, not for every single page and every single image that you download from that site. And it also had to support multiple requests at the same time, because you're downloading from one web server or several, and then you want to improve the quality of your downloads. So that was the driving force behind it. So what exactly did we do? Network access is basically consisting of three main classes. There is the manager, which is the main class where, think of it as a node where things are put together. You prepare a request, you pass it to the manager, and you get a reply back. That was basically it. This is the main description of how it works. So the request is actually one request to be sent. It contains one URL. Does everybody know what a URL is? And it also contains some metadata, some extra information that the web servers or even network access itself can use to improve the request or get the exact one that you wanted, like HTTP headers. Often you want to pass extra information, but also SSL options, like which certificate to use, which authorities to accept and also controlling behavior, like I said. The example there is caching. And the reply is basically the output of that. It contains also a URL and the request that generated that reply. I'd like the request it contains extra metadata, so information about how the request was obtained, but also dates, but also cookies, again. It also contains the data itself. Unlike the request, the reply contains data. It's a QIO device, so it's a class that I hope you're familiar with. It's used in QFile, QProcess, and Sockets. It's read-only and sequential access. When you get a network reply, it's already open, so you don't have to do anything else other than to read it, and it's guaranteed not to be finished yet. So you're sure that by the time you get it, it will still emit signals. It will emit the signal called ready read when data arrives, just like you process, just like the socket classes. And it also emits finished when it's finished, so that you can, if you want, just catch that signal and do your processing later. Most of my examples are using just the finished signal here for brevity, but you can also improve 
by using readyV. And if any problem occurs, it emits the error signal. And in the meantime, it also emits these two signals, download and upload progress, so that you can do nice progress bars and indicates to your user that your application is doing some work. Now the manager. Like I said, the manager is the center of everything. It's where everything is concentrated. It supports four operations as of now, which is basically to downloads and uploads, get and put. They're named after the HTTP requests because we thought that since this was the, was the most used for the network access, people would be more used to HTTP. It can also obtain the status of a file without actually downloading it. And this HTTP operation called POST, which is a hybrid of uploading and downloading and processing on the server side. For each operation, there is one simple method. So if you want to do HAD, you call HAD. If you want to get data, download it, you call download, uh, GET. And if it's one of the variants that do some kind of uploading, they take as a parameter the data to be uploaded. And they will give you, as an output, the network reply. Like I said, not yet finished. It manages the request queue. So if you have multiple requests at the same time, it will des decide on its own which one comes first. Usually, it's a first-in, first-out order, but we're planning on providing priorities in the future. It centralizes settings, like I said. Proxy support, cookie jar, and there's more coming in 4.5. One of the requirements was authentications had to be cached. So it does that for you. And it even does better that if the connections are opened to a server, which is maybe a costly operation on the network, it keeps them open, but only for a short time, so that if necessary, it's disconnected. Cookies. That's a nice cookie, isn't it? Chocolate chips. Everybody loves cookies, but that's not the cookie that I'm talking about. The documentation defines cookies as cookies are small bits of information that stateless protocols like HTTP use to maintain some persistent information across requests. What that means is that the server sends you something, a cookie, and you send back the cookie when you're talking to the server. Usually that's not how I do with cookies. When somebody gives me the cookie, I eat it. But whoever came up with the, the name decided that cookies you passed along. There's one class for it called NetQ Network Cookie, and it does all of the parsing for you. So when you give it the raw form, it parses it for you and gives you the information that you need. And if necessary, it recreates that form for you. Here's an example. You create a cookie with the name key and a value 42. So if you try to use it, you'll see the raw form as shown in the second line. And how you set it on a request, you simply set the header set cookie with that cookie. And when you're reading, you ask for the cookies, the cookie header, and you reach, uh, receive a list of cookies. It's important to know that servers can return more than one cookie. And where do you keep your cookies? In the cookie jar. So we have a class called QNetwork Cookie Jar, which is extensible because it only provides basic security. It has two virtual functions that you can use to override. Well, that was one that is called when a request is about to be sent, and one that is called when a reply has come with more cookies. So the idea here is that you may implement your own security policy by deciding which requests have access to which cookies. Like I said, one of all the other requirements for network access was the ability to extend. Why would you want to extend network access? Here are some examples. 
you could have the need to handle special requests like access to protocols that are not part of network access originally. You could want to access a different backend. For example, in KDE, I know that there's some work so that Qt network access can be used with KIO. So instead of using our implementation of HTTP and FTP, it would use KDE's, so integrating with the system. It could, for instance, apply policies. Like I said, for the cookie jar, you might want to say, this request you're not allowed to send. So it might filter those and say, this one is invalid, error. Or it could say, this one actually, it goes somewhere else. So rewriting them. There are probably many other reasons why you would want to extend it. How you do it, Qnetwork Network Access has one central function called create request that is called whenever somebody wants to create a new request. It simply creates the reply and queues it for the later for later. If you want to extend it, you can just override this function, do your own changes, and call the parent class. Or alternatively, you can return your own network reply. This is actually very complex to do at this point, so I'm not going to address it on this presentation. But the information is available on the documentation on how to do it. I'm going to show now some examples of the API news. So, one of the requirements was to make it easy. So, how easy is it? Here are two examples. The first one is simply obtaining one URL from the trolltech.com website. And it connects finished somewhere else so that you can handle when it's done. You see that there is a manager on the first line. You get a reply on the second one by sending a request. Your network request is actually hidden in here, but it's there as a parameter to get. And you connect the reply. The second example here is doing the same thing as the first one, except that it's sending two requests. Does the, do the requests look familiar? Yes. These are the examples. The first one example is the one I had shown for QHTTP. And the second one is the new code. So compare the two. They do the same thing. But for the first one I had said, you have to remember the IDs. You have to read everything by the end, otherwise it would get overwritten. Those requirements are not there for the new framework. Everything is kept for you, so no caveats anymore. Here's a more full example. This is a downloader, downloader class. It gets something and sends something back. I know that the font is a bit small, but don't worry. I'm going to be highlighting the important parts of this class in the next slides. So, the first thing is that it has a download manager, an access manager. So, when you create this downloader class, what it does is that it connects the signal finished to a finished slot. And it constructs, because it's the constructor, the access manager. Very simple, this does actually nothing special. What's the contract between this class and its user? There, there is one public function called download that takes a URL as a parameter and there's a signal called done which is emitted when the request is done and it contains as a payload the URL that you asked and the data associated with it. This is the contract, one 
function that you call and one signal. And you can see from the example that all that the download function, the public function that you call does is call the manager and call get. You might notice that that get, that download function, does not store its reply. Why is it allowed to do that? Because the reply itself, that pointer, you don't have to store because it's passed as a parameter. So here we see in where the most of the work is done. So when the request is finished, what it does is that it gets the data on the second parameter, read all, and the URL, and emits the signal. And the first line here, delete later, this is where memory management occurs. That's all. This is the class entirely. And notice that it was about 25 lines of code to download data from the internet. 25 lines of code. Is it easy to use it or not? Of course, you can improve it. What else can, we, can you do it? What else can you do? You can handle authentication challenges. More, more often than not, there is a password that you have to use. And obviously, everything isn't perfect. So there are errors. The server isn't accessible. Or the data that you're looking for isn't there. Or the intern tripped on the network cable and you don't have access to the network. That happens. There are also SSL issues like, is the server trusted? Do you want to connect to it? And you might want to have access to that metadata. So the date, like I mentioned, it might be important for you to know, has the file changed? Is it new? Do I save the date? Or the cookies? They always come back. And an interesting thing is that you probably want to use a shared network access manager. The reason for that is that often there is only one need for one in the application. You don't need many. It centralizes everything and it handles the connection so that each request is in sequence. I'm going to show now some of those improvements. Starting with the authentication challenges. So this is the old constructor like we had seen before. Nothing changed here. All you have to do is connect to some extra signals. So you see here that I've highlighted the section. I've connected two to two extra signals, authentication required and proxy authentication required. As parameters, they take this of Q authenticator class, which is not new. I don't know if you have used it. But all you have to do is in the class that you receive call set user and set password. If your application doesn't know it, usually what it does is that it asks the user. It pops up a dialog saying, please enter your username and password. And that information is passed along. In the meantime, the application could be doing other requests that don't require authentication. I didn't write the code for the slot, but you can see here that it's not very difficult to use. How about error handling? Here's one way to do it. I've come up with two alternatives. The finished signal is emitted. When it's emitted, the error is set if there's an error. So you just check. If it's an error, you handle it somehow. You pop up a dialog saying failed, for example. If it's not, then you proceed as, you, as before. You emit done saying this is finished. This is how it's up to you to decide how to do it. The second alternative just like the first, is that there's an error signal, but it is on the reply itself. 
and you just have to modify this function called download instead. But again, when you receive that error, it's up to you to decide how to handle it. I'm just giving you the pointers that you need how to do it. Another thing that people ask more often than not is how can I download the entire data before finishing? They want syn synchronous downloading. I've been asked very often to imp implement the wait for functions in network access, just like you process and just like the socket classes. Unfortunately, that's very difficult to do for several reasons that you may discuss with me by email later if you want, but suffice to say that we decided to go against it. So there are no wait for functions. You cannot say wait for finished and then wait until everything is done synchronously. But you can do with an event loop. So as you can see here, this is a function I called synchronous download. It takes a request as a parameter, it starts the request on the first line, on the last line it returns everything. How does it implement it? It uses an event loop, connects the finish signal to the quit slot, so this runs until it's finished. How can you improve this one? I'm not going to go into details, but for instance you might want to handle timeouts. Do you want to wait an hour until this request is done? You might want to implement a minute and saying, I'm sorry, problem, there's probably a problem on the network. This code also isn't handling errors, but you can use what I've just shown you before about error handling. Can we move on? So, what's coming in Qt 4.5? What's new? There are two new features in 4.5. We came up with the page caching and the proxy factory. I'm going to go into details into each one of those. The problematic of data caching is network transfers are often costly. In some countries, you even pay per byte or per minute that you're connected. In other countries, you don't. But you must remember when you used a modem and it was very slow to download stuff, to download a simple web page. That's still the reality in many countries, in many places in the world, meaning that you probably want to avoid retransferring the data. If you have it once, you want to keep it, you want to cache it, so that later if you need it, it's already there. We implemented this new base class called Abstract Network Cache and tightly integrated with the Access Manager. You simply call set cache on the manager and the manager will automatically make use of it. So how exactly does it make use of your abstract class? The Network Manager provides four policies to choose from. They're listed here, but just so that you understand what they mean, the default is preferred network, meaning if the data on the network is newer, we use that. If it's the same as what we have, we use what we have and avoid retransferring. That's the default. But if you're, for instance, implementing a browser, sometimes the user presses F5 to reload the data. We implement that as the always network policy, meaning do not try to use the cache, always download from the network, always download again. And of, more often than not, browsers often support the offline browsing mode, meaning do not use the network. I've unplugged the cable but I still want to use what I had downloaded. That's the always cache policy. Do not use the network, always use the cache. 
What happens if you don't have the data? Well, then we get an error. This page is not cached. Please connect to the network again. The fourth one is called prefer cache, which means if it's on the cache, use it. And if it's not, use the network. The difference is on prefer network, the default, we check if the network has something newer, if the web server has updated the page, if the FTP server has new files. If it doesn't, then we use the cache. On always cache, we go to the cache first. If it's there, we use it, regardless of whether there's newer data to be downloaded. And usually, what happens is that the caching is done on disk. You download something and you save it <coughs> sorry, on disk. So implemented this public class called QNetwork Disk Cache. It's a sample implementation of data caching. Actually, it's fully featured and works quite well for our tests. Basically, what it does is that everything that is downloaded, it saves to a directory. Not everything, actually. It doesn't save your credit card and your bank web pages. Those secure ones, it doesn't save. But everything else, like images, like CSS style sheets, or other information that comes along, it saves to one directory on disk. It also controls the cache size, which is we don't want to have a cache running out of a disk space. You don't want to use all your disk space for every single page that you've visited for the past two years. So it controls making sure that it doesn't run over that limit. And when it's closed, what it does is that it deletes the oldest data. As far as we can tell, it should work for multiple processes. Meaning, why would you want to do that? I, I guess that you've heard of this recent Google browser called Chrome. One of the things that they said was new was that every single process, every single page, sorry, every single tab was a different process. They had many reasons to do that. But if you want to use that same functionality in your browser, you need to have the cache accessible for multiple processes. We think this class does that for you. And by caching, we usually improve speed because we use the network much less and data on disk is much faster to access. The other feature was proxy factory. The problematic is different destinations, different servers are accessed via different proxies. Usually you only have one. That's the standard on uh, corporate networks. But sometimes there's more. Yes, the reason is probably because they have failovers. So if the first server doesn't work, you're going to use the second one. Or for instance, there's data that you don't want proxied. Or there's data that you want proxied with a different proxy. So we thought that we should handle those cases too. And there's also one thing that's quite common on networks, which is proxy alter configuration. It's basically some code, a JavaScript code, that says for this host, use that, for this host, use that, for this one, don't use that. So we wanted to support those two. So what we had before was one single proxy for all requests. You could call on the application, set application proxy or you could set on the manager, set, use this proxy. The problem with that was it doesn't work for everything. Like I said, sometimes you want different proxies. So we came up with this new uh, base class called proxy factory, which is, like the name says, a factory. It creates Q-network proxies. And just like before with the cache, 
It's integrated with the access manager. You simply call set proxy factory, and it will start using that factory for any request that it may send. How does it work? For each request that you send to the proxy factory, it does some processing and returns a list of proxies. Currently, we just find the first one that is suitable. In the future, we're thinking of testing it and caching. If that first proxy that you tried didn't work, let's try the second one. And let's not try the first one again for the next proxies. But currently, we only do the first one. The factory is also available globally. So this feature is also used by QTCP socket. And like I said, the script basically is just JavaScript code, like I mentioned before. And it maps very well to the model that we designed. So we have one JavaScript that takes as input the host name and the URL and returns a list of proxies. I'm going to go back and forth so you see it. This is the model of the proxy factory, and this is the model of the scripts. It's the same. This is how we why we designed it the way we do. We did. We don't have the interpreter on Qt itself. This is actually some new code we're experimenting with. You can find it on the lab's webpage soon enough. We're going to provide it so that you can use your own application. There's more, actually. We also implemented system proxies. So on Windows and on Mac currently, we try to get the settings from the system. And the model is exactly like the one we have here. We have one entry, one request, some processing, some work, and then at the end we have a list of proxies to be tried in order. Oops, wrong direction. Qt 4.5 is just around the corner. We've just released, by the time you're seeing this, this video, the technical preview. And feedback is always welcome. So Updates and fixes will be available through the snapshots and later releases. And um, I hope this will be useful to you. So, to summarize, Qt Network Access is very powerful and it's very easily extendable. I hope that the examples I showed piqued your interest on in how to use it. You can always contact me later if you have questions. And if you think you can, if you have suggestions for improvements for this API, I'm always open to them. Thank you very much.